My text this morning, and I just want to give you a little introduction for those that are taking off, is going to be in 1 Kings. We're going to talk about a man named Jeroboam this morning. But what I wanted to do first is tell you something that happened to me that provoked the thought in this message. Good morning, y'all come on in. Provoke the thought in this message. And the thought, it goes something like this. I, I was talking to a Mormon yesterday. Um, I'm very patient with people like that. I like talking to them. You don't have to believe everything I believe for me to talk to you. I'm not scared to talk to people. I hope you're not scared to talk to people. What's the worst going to happen? They walk away and still don't believe. That's the worst that can happen. Um, and so... Um, other people of other faiths don't intimidate me, don't bother me. They're just people. Some of them don't know any better. They don't. Take the time to care for them and talk to them. So the guy was 60 years old. Ten years ago, he became a Mormon. So at age 50, he became a Mormon. Um, and you could tell he really believed what the Mormon church teaches. And quoted passages, and then went back and forth for over an hour. And I could tell some of the conversations that I had with him, they bothered him. But when you're in religion, you don't like getting out of that religion. You just like just sticking to it. You're comfortable with it, right? So I asked him a question by way of introduction to what I'm going to say this morning. I want to say this to everybody before they took off and we all divide it up. My, I, it's a question that bothered me how he answered I said, if somebody could take you to the scriptures and show you emphatically the word of God, not the word or opinions of man, they could take you to the verses and show you that the way you believe and the things that you're doing are wrong, would you leave the Mormon church? And he said, no, I would never leave the Mormon church. I said, let me make sure that I'm clear. I want to ask you one more time. If somebody took the word of God and made it very clear that the way you believe is wrong, would you submit and conform to it and abandon any belief you had that were contrary to it? He said, no. You know what I said to him? I said, I love you, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but you're a very dishonest person. Listen, there are many things over the years I've had to abandon that I once believed. <clears throat> he told me earlier that the Word of God was the standard, and that he believed the Word of God, and what it said is what he believes. And then he turned right around when I asked him, would he be willing to, to conform his life to the word of God and said, no, I'm going to stick with my religion. Do you know there's a lot of people? There's a lot of, we're independent Baptists. If anybody didn't know, we're not Southern Baptists, we're independent Baptists. That's the doctrine we believe. But I'm not none of that compared to being a Christian. I, don't, I, I abandon all of that in light of being a Christian. There are things I was taught uh, as an independent Baptist. I didn't grow up independent Baptist. I grew up Westland. There were things I, taught, I was taught as an independent Baptist I had to evaluate in light of the Word of God that I believed years, for years. I preached for years that I had to abandon when I realized it was contrary to the Word of God. So I don't ask that man something I'm not willing to stand by myself. Let me tell you something. If you, I'm talking about the congregation that I'm looking at, any one of you could show me from the word of God where I'm wrong. It is the standard, and as pastor of this church, I'm willing to change what I believe and conform it to the word of God. That's the right heart. The word of God is the standard. Now, with that said, let me ask you as introduction to this message, are you willing to do the same thing? If somebody could show you from the word of God that you were off track in what you believe, would you be willing to conform your life to the word of God or is it just a religion to you? 
There's a big difference. And so this morning, well, I'll dismiss the children's church, and let's, let's go to 1 Kings. Children's church, if anybody wants to go to that, y'all go on and help yourself. Be a part of that. All right. Okay. Invite some kids. Amen. Amen. I'll invite some kids. Bring some little children so they can teach them. Amen. All right. We're going to go to uh, the book of 1 Kings chapter number 11 this morning, which is where we're going to start. Now, I don't know what uh, a lot of you know. Um, I'm not going to skip around. Turn here, turn here, turn here, turn here. I like doing that sometimes. But this morning, we're just going to stay basically in three chapters, and they're right in the same book of the Bible. And uh, I want to teach a, a, really a historical application slash character study of this guy named Jeroboam. Um, if you know the history of Jeroboam, uh, I don't know who here knows Jeroboam, who here has read about him, but Solomon... We know him for the wisest man in the Bible, right? Don't we know Sol Solomon that way? How many of you have heard of the wisdom of Solomon, right? But how many of you have heard of the idolatry and the fall of Solomon just a few chapters in the Kings? He was the wisest man, but yet his worldly wisdom did not keep him right with God. He still had to make a choice. Let me tell you something. You may be wise. You may be street wise, you may be wise of this world, you may be wise about the things of God, but that doesn't guarantee you that you're not going to fall. Yeah. You hear me? So what happens is Solomon fell into idolatry. What was his fall, men? It was strange women. And you better be careful because it'll be your same fall if you're not careful. There were women who were, listen, people like to make it the color of skin issue. It wasn't a color of skin issue with Solomon. His fall wasn't the fact that he married somebody who was of a different nation. His fall, and you see that. You say, how do you know that? Well, what about Ruth the Moabitess? She was of another nation. And she was a godly woman in the lineage of David. His fall is that he married a woman, multiple women, that were caught up with idols, and you can read of his fall. It's a sad fall. The Lord began to turn away from him and promised that his kingdom was going to be divided. So he had a servant named Jeroboam. His son, Rehoboam, was supposed to take the kingdom. This servant was in his house, trained by Solomon, and that servant was sent a messenger of God, which we're going to read about this morning, that told him... God has handpicked you when this kingdom divides. You're going to be one of the ones that are going to take ten tribes. And Judah and eventually Benjamin would go with Rehoboam and stick with him. Jeroboam sees and hears the mistakes of Solomon. And we're going to read the words of the preacher. The preacher actually comes to him and tells him Solomon has messed up. This is his sin right here. God has chosen you. You have an opportunity to do what's right and not commit the same mistake, and God will bless you. You know, the story of Jeroboam could have been different. And I'm going to tell you, you say, how, where are you going at with this preacher? If some of you would just listen to the preacher who loves you dearly, I'm nobody special. But if I'm pointing you to God, you need to listen. I'm trying to help you, trying my best to help you. But you know what Jeroboam's mistake was? It wasn't that he didn't know. The, the prophet is actually going to tell him, this is why the kingdom is rent out of Solomon. And then he's going to tell him, God is willing to bless you if you'll just do what's right. I believe the story could have read in Jeroboam's day that Jeroboam did that which was right in the sight of God and, and Rehoboam was over here uh, doing that which was right in the sight of God. There's no reason why both of them couldn't. And then later the, the kingdom unify, which it did later. But at this division, Jeroboam begins to think only of himself 
And that's where we get in trouble. Instead of listening to the preacher who is desperately trying to help us, we decide, I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. He's not telling me what to do. And I'm not, I, I'm not one to tell you what to do anyway. I'm just going to preach what's right. If you don't like it, you'll have to deal with it. If you do like it, then, then do something about it. If you don't like it, especially do something about it. Usually if you don't like it, it's because you know it's right and you're fighting it. Let's look at the Word of God. Chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. Let me get there. 1 Kings chapter number 11. We'll start down around verse number 26. So I wanted to give you that history to catch you up, and you'll, you'll know where we're at now. 1 Kings 11, look at verse number 26. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the Ephratite of Zereda, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo, Milo, and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over the charge of the house of Joseph. Can you see God's hand in that? God begins to bless this person named Jeroboam, and he makes him look good in the eyes of Solomon, because God has a plan. And it came to pass at that time when uh, Jeroboam went out uh, of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the uh, Shilonite, found him in the way. And he clad himself in a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. How many tribes? Twelve tribes. So he's going to rent it in twelve pieces. And he said unto Jeroboam, Take ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and I will give ten tribes to thee, but he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, and for uh, Jerusalem's sake, and the city which I have chosen out of the tribes of Israel. And we know that initially that tribe is Judah, and then Benjamin's going to be a part of that tribe eventually. And we know that those two, uh, are, when we see the kings of Judah is what they're called. From this point on, what you're going to see is you're going to see all the kings of Israel, all the kings of Judah, and it's going to be a separate kingdom. So you read through Chronicles, it'll talk about the kings of Judah, the kings of Israel. They're not the same. It's a different line. The only good kings you will find, interesting fact, are found in Judah. Why? Why? Why did God preserve Judah and not the ten tribes of Israel? Because there was a promise. There was promise all the way back to Genesis 49 that God would bring the Messiah out of the tribe of Judah. And you find that interwoven all through the scriptures. He was preserving that tribe because that's where all the promises of him raising up the Savior, Jesus, came. Guess what? He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what it calls him in the book of Revelation. Let's look here. Verse number 32. But he shall have one tribe for thy servant David's sake and Jerusalem's sake and the city I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth. Why? Did, did, did Jeroboam know why? Solomon was being judged and the kingdom was being divided? You know he did because this prophet is actually spelling it out to him. Brethren, you don't have to commit the same mistakes that everybody else makes. I'm sick and tired of running into people that say, well, you got to make your own mistakes. You don't have to. You choose to. Well, your kids need to make some mistakes. They don't have to. Jeroboam did not have to make a mistake right here. 
He was given the message. If you'll be obedient to the word of God, you don't have to make the same mistakes your mama made, your daddy made, your grandparents, your cousins, your husband, your wife, your friends, your previous pe preachers. I hate it when people compare me to other preachers that have been here. Because I don't have to make the same mistakes they made. It's a choice, y'all. Everything in life is a choice. You can choose to do exactly what everybody else has done wrong if you want to. And Jeroboam's being warned here. And it's being spelled out to him clearly. God has spelled out to some of you clearly that there's things in, in, in religious people's lives that you've been exposed to that are wrong and are wicked and are vile and it's hindered you and it's hurt you and it's hurt other people. And I'm telling you this, you don't have to make the same mistakes. You can make a difference. It's your choice. Quit blaming other people and do right yourself. Watch Jeroboam. You know, Jeroboam is going to do even worse than Solomon. He was warned, and I want to show you, God intended to bless Jeroboam. You say, no, just, just hold on, let's read. Watch what it says here. Because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Chemish, the god of Moabites and Milcom, the God of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which was right in mine eyes. Now listen, this is going to be careful. To do that which is, let's, let's note this, let's underline this. To do that which is right in whose eyes? Who's talking? It's God talking. That's going to be important. I want you to remember what he just said there. Because we're going to see the problem of Jeroboam is completely opposite of what was said here. Listen, the prophet made it clear. The preacher is preaching his hardest to get you to see something right now. Now, it's up to you whether you want to ignore the word of God and the preacher who's begging you and pleading with you. The things God has already shown you and you know are wrong, you need to get them right. Listen, the preacher ain't even mentioned nothing this morning. Personal. I've never, I haven't mentioned a single thing in particular, have I? And some of your consciences are already bothering you. That is the thing you need to get right. That thing that's already bothering you, you need to get that right. I ain't even mentioned the details, and it's on your heart and mind. You say, how do you know? Because I've sat right there, been under conviction myself, and it bothered me. It's amazing how many things the Holy Spirit will tell you that the preacher didn't even say. Because you already know on inside what you need to do. Look at this. And have walked in, in uh, not walked in my ways to do that which is right in my eyes, to keep my statutes and my judgments as David is father. Verse 34. Howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days uh, of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I've chosen because I've kept my commandment and my statutes. Why does God preserve the nation of Judah? Because he's keeping his commandments and his statutes. You don't keep your promises, but rest assured, God always keeps his promises. Amen. You may go back on your word. God does not go back on his word. He said he was going to work through the lion of the tribe of Judah, through the tribe of Judah, all the way from the beginning, all the way through the scriptures. You read in the prophets, guess what it is? It's Judah. It's the nation of Judah that he's going to raise up a savior. And you know what he does all the way through the scriptures? Exactly what he said he was going to do. He kept his word. So he said, look, I'm going to divide the kingdom, but I'm not getting rid of Judah. Because I got something special for them. Verse 35. But I will take the kingdom out of his uh, son's hand and give it unto the ten tribes. And to his sons will I give one tribe... And David, uh, that David, my servant, may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, and the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee. Who's he talking to? I will take thee. He's talking to Jeroboam, isn't he? Watch what he says to Jeroboam, lest you think Jeroboam was doomed and cursed 
to, to fall into idolatry and wickedness, lest you think that, I want you to see the promise that God made to Jeroboam. I will take thee, thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shalt be king over Israel, and it shall be. One word. What's that next word? Listen, y'all. There's an if right in your life right now. The preacher is trying to tell you, if you will hearken and listen to the word of God, he will do something on your behalf you didn't think he could do. But if you don't and you decide to reject like Jeroboam, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble. Your end. Listen, my last note, and we're going to talk about this. My last note is this. The story could have been different. And I'm telling you this. Your story can be different if you choose God instead of what you want. Now that's going to take some courage. If you choose God, there's going to be some friends that don't like you. If you choose God, there's going to be some family that don't like you. If you choose God, there's going to be some people in this world that don't like you. Brother Alex, I, I think it was yesterday, maybe it was last week, but Brother Alex gave the illustration that you can go uh, into Walmart and you can, you can have loud music play and you can act like a fool. You, you can be dressed all kind of weird ways and moronic ways, at, but then you can walk into Walmart singing, We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and they'll go, Oh man, that's a nut. You tell me what this world hates. Jesus said, marvel not if the world hates you. You know, it hated me first. Mm -hmm. It hated him enough to put him on a cross. Listen, darkness has always hated light. Always. Listen, you better get to a point in your life as a Christian. Brother Roloff used to say this, where you enjoy being called a fanatic. Because that's what they'll call you. It's amazing. What do you think the term fan is? What is that short for? Anybody got ball teams here? What's your ball teams? I don't know what your ball teams are. Some of you might like Dallas Cowgirls or something like that. I don't know. I don't watch any of that. I just don't fool with it. I don't have time for it. Used to. I used to watch. I used, my favorite used to be the Washington No-Namers. You know? Can't call them Redskins no more. But I was a fanatic when I watched. We, we'll go to these parades. You wouldn't believe it, Mike. We'll go to these parades. I'll have, we've gone to ball parades. We've gone to the Georgia-Florida game. 180,000 people there. What a great place to preach the gospel. Right? We'll go outside the stadium. My sign that is my favorite, y'all, you think, well, it's, it's, it's a bunch of verses on hell. I got one of them. That says some Bible verses on hell, and I just list the references. Are you willing to gamble with your soul for eternity? That's what it says at the bottom. But that's not my favorite one. I know that's going to be a rough one to hold. <laughs> but I hold it sometimes just to take the reproach. It's still the truth. My favorite one says, sad, lonely, depressed. Jesus Christ is still the answer. And it's got four scripture references at the bottom. Whoever would be offended at that? So I stood there one time, smiling, holding my son. Gospel track. Oh, you fanatic! You're a fanatic! You're crazy! You're a nut! Well, first of all, you haven't talked to me. You don't know whether I'm crazy or not. But I'm looking at this guy, Florida Georgia game. He's got a big old gator on top of his head. No shirt on, painted one half one color and one half the other color. Every piece of attire on him is a gator attire. Even had gator shoestrings. And I'm looking going, so I'm the fanatic because I love somebody who actually paid for the sins of the world but you're a fanatic because you like somebody who can throw a ball down the, the field and, and make an interception and lose a game. 
I don't, this world, I'm telling you all, listen. If you're going to take a stand and avoid the pitfall that Jeroboam did not avoid, you're going to have to take a stand. You're going to have to be bold. You're going to have to be courageous. Listen, Christianity is not for wimps. Talking to a brother last night who preached a message on it. Christianity is not for wins. If you think it is, you're wrong. The Christians are some of the most strong people I've ever met on the planet because they take a lot of heat. The ones that really stand. They take a lot of heat. Show me a group of people outside the nation of Israel that's more hated. It's Bible Christians. They will make you look like a nut. Show me one single movie that paints a Christian in a I'm talking about Hollywood. All this Hollywood. Every time there's a Christian in the movie, they're a nut. Do you ever notice that? They got an agenda, y'all. If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to take a stand. You're going to have to ignore all that. And you're going to have to focus on one person. One person's opinion matters about your life. And that's God. Nobody else's matters. And listen to me. Not the preacher, not the Sunday school teacher, not the deacon, not the mother-in-law, not the father-in-law. Listen, not the best Christian you know, not your friends. None of those opinions matter. Do you know that the preacher could misjudge you? I have. Not willingly. I have. That's why one person's opinion matters. One person's opinion. And you should try to please him. Jeroboam didn't learn that lesson. Look at this. Look at verse 38. And it shall be if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and will walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my sight, and uh, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant, and I will be with thee, now watch the promise. I will be with thee. Who's he talking to? Jeroboam. And build thee a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel unto thee. Man, that's a strong... You say, well, God never intended. That's what he said. He can still fulfill the lion of the tribe of Judah if, if Jeroboam was over Israel. You say, well, it would have never worked out. God always keeps his word. And listen, what some of you don't realize is you've already been given the if. And you already know that you're at a crossroads and you've got to figure out which way you're going. You're either going to continue on the path that's called self-will, self-will, what I want, the way I want it, how I want it. We live in a, we call it a Burger King society. Uh, the old sl uh, slogan for Burger King used to be, your way right away. That's the society we're living in. You've got to give up your way, and you're going to have to figure out. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof is the ways of death. The way we need to be walking in is the Lord's way, and you're going to have to forsake your way and go his way. Let's look at this. But Jeroboam was given a promise. What a promise. Man, who is this servant that he would deserve this? And you know what? The prophet even gives him a good illustration. I, 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 I hate it when pre preachers are just negative, right? Negative, negative, negative. Um, you, your, um, your sermons have to be negative and positive. Unfortunately, we live in a world of sin... So if you don't preach against sin, you're preaching a half-truth. So some of them are going to be negative. That's a fact. But I'm going to tell you something. The preacher does something pretty spectacular here. He says, I don't want you to follow Solomon. But if you wanted a good example of somebody who was after my heart, yeah, he sinned. Somebody who really had the intent to follow me. You look at David. David really loved me. Solomon wondered. Yes, David sinned and got it right and went forward, but Solomon wondered. He tells him, don't follow him. You look at that example. Now, I'm not talking about following him in his sin, but the overall life of David, he was a very valiant man. He was very tender to the will of God. 
even after he sinned. You want to read about his sins? His, he didn't boast about it. You know, I, I, I'm a, it's a shame. If some of you have social media, you know what I'm talking about. People will get on social media. They'll come to church, hoop and holler. I've seen, I've seen them. I've seen them put videos of church and all this, and they're having a good time, and it's everything, hoopla. And then two days later, they'll get on social media and fo- uh, 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 post something that's profane and vile and, and worldly and maybe cussing and uh, half-dressed this and half-dressed that. You know what I'm talking about. It's true. The real you is on that social media page. That's the real you. And people come out. It's amazing how they, they put the real person on there. And I say to myself, you know, listen, you got to be careful in your life because there's people watching you. There's people who know whether you're the real deal or not. If you're going to follow God, follow Him with all your heart. Give Him everything. Be obedient to His Word. And listen, little things, little things in the Bible that people overlook sometimes. You know, not... Hebrews 10 says not to forsake the assembling yourselves together as a matter of some is. So much more to see, as you see the day approaching. You know what the Bible says? We should meet more as we see the day approaching. Is the day approaching or is it not? Do you, do, do you believe scripture-wise, uh, you go to Matthew 24, you read through the book of Revelation, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, do you believe we're closer or further away from the Lord coming back? This world is in a state that's really close to causing the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe there's, I don't mark it by the vileness of the world. That's not how I mark whether the Lord's coming back or not. He says this gospel must go to all the kingdoms, Matthew 24. You know how I mark when he's going to blow that horn and it's time to come up hither? There's a little belt. Can't remember what Man, he called it. It was either the 410 or the 1040 belt that's around the center of the earth. And if you look, those nations are the only nations left where the gospel has not been preached to. And it's narrowing, narrowing, narrowing. And God's sending missionaries to that belt. I believe we're so close. Once the gospel gets in those places, It's time for the Lord to come back. Listen, so many people are ignoring the signs. So many people, so many people. Listen, they're used to, I I, I talk to uh, Nettles all the time. This church, and I'm not a numbers man, but it does show you the state of Christianity. They talk about these pews being full and the doors being open and, and stacking chairs going down the aisle out the front. People wanting to hear. People sitting here for hours hearing the word of God. You try that now. I, listen, it's funny. New people come and they, this is what they wind up doing. Not all of them. Thank the Lord, not all of them. They'll be like, hmm, it's 12 o'clock. Man, he must have not got the memo. Somebody, the, the committee needs to get and talk to him. Listen, when you're preaching the word of God, it doesn't matter whether it's 15 minutes or it's an hour and a half. And I'm not saying beat a dead horse. Once you said what you got to say, sit down and shut up. That's what I learned in Bible school. The main thing I got out of the Bible school is say what God says and then sit down and shut up. But I'm going to say this. Why isn't there a hunger and thirst for the word of God like there used to be? I'm talking about church people who are more interested in getting out of church and going home and watching their show or playing, I mean, uh, God forbid, there's there's some pretty serious video games you get in a war over. (laughs) You know, it was a while back with this Call of Duty I was first coming out. And there was a guy in our church, my home church, that um, he told me, Brother Mike, he said, I got a problem. He said, I'm addicted. I said, addicted? What are you addicted to? He said, this video game. He said, I've been up for 36 hours playing this video game. Excuse me? (laughs) 36 hours playing a video game. I said, man. 
And he said, the sad thing is when I got done, I felt like I accomplished nothing. And I said, you know what? It's because you accomplished nothing. Yeah. Listen, this world is full of distractions. It is full of distractions. But I'm going to tell you, as this thing is approaching, we need to repent. I'm talking about the preacher, too. I'm, I don't just preach to you. We need to repent, get some things right in our lives so we don't fall into the pitfall that Jeroboam's going to fall into here. Let's look at him. Believe it or not, I'm, I'm about halfway through, a little over halfway through. So if you'll bear with me. Look what it says in verse number 39. And if I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt, unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Isn't that something? What a message. The preacher shows up. I'm going to give you the kingdom, ten tribes. I'm going to give them two. Well, one, and then two. They're going to have two to begin uh, when it's over with. But I'm going to divide this kingdom. You're going to get ten of them. If you'll do what's right, I'm going to bless you. Even though I'm going to bring Solomon's crowd back into this thing. But I'll bless you if you just do what's right. Did he do what's right, y'all? Let me show you this. He was already given the word of the preacher who cared enough to tell him the truth. He did not learn from the mistakes of Solomon. He didn't listen. Even though God said, if you'll hearken, I'll bless you. That's what some of you don't realize. The preacher knows where some of you could be. If you just say, I'm done running. You made a mess up to this point. But he is the master, the master at putting the pieces back together. He's the master healer, y'all. I'm telling you. I've seen some things you never... I, I just talked with Brother Manny last night. I want to have this preacher in. If I can have him in, I don't think y'all can handle him. I really don't think y'all can handle him. But I still want to have him in. Out of Ohio, you've heard me talk about him, Earl Ankrum. So I asked him, is Earl, uh, he brought up a, a pre young preacher that's going to preach in his church that is the son-in-law to Earl Ankrum. So I said, is Earl still preaching? He said, brother, he's, he's not pastoring a church. What he's doing now is he's going to churches and doing public ministry with them. He's going and door knocking with them. He's street preaching with them. He's, if they do door hangers. But man, you got to hear this guy preach. Literally, literally. You, you, say, you say, why are you saying this? I'm trying to tell you God can take the worst circumstances in your life and make something very beautiful out of it. This guy was a heroin addict. He would preach. It was hilarious. He would preach, and if it got too quiet, it started getting real quiet, he'd run. Now, literally, and I tell you, he's about that big around, you know, about that big around. He'd run down. Amen, 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 amen. Am I, have y'all ever heard him? Oh, man, that guy was, he was a nut job, but we loved him. We loved him. You say, what was his past? That guy's done pastor several churches. He was a church planner. He planted several churches in Ohio. I think the count was about eight or ten. Sold out, but he did not start out right. He started out wrong. And the Lord took all of that and healed that man and made him usable. That's what he'll do for you. You've got to make up your mind. That's what you want. Let's look at Jeroboam. Go to um, chapter 12, if you would. Let's look at verse number 26. Now, he's already been given the message from the preacher. Some of you already received the message. I've talked to some of y'all personally. Some of y'all, other preachers have talked to you, and you know what's right. But watch what he does. He had a chance to have a wonderful ministry uh, and, and a wonderful uh, kingdom. Let's look at verse number 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. And if this people go to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, and unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Is that true or is it false? 
That's not what God promised him. That's not what the preacher told him. Can I tell you something? Some of you got fears that are contrary to what you know God has already told you he would do. Isn't it amazing how we, we have these fears in our heart that we allow to grow that, that aren't even justified to begin with? Well, if I don't do this, like God, God don't mean what he says. Well, i got to do this and this because if I don't do this, it ain't going to work out. Everybody's going to be mad at me. Everybody's going to be angry. Now, they're going to try to fire me. They're going to do it. You don't have it figured out. God has it figured out. And if he already told you and made it clear to you that he was going to bless you if you just be obedient, then you need to get to doing that. Watch him. This is how it starts. He begins to question the word of God. Look at verse 28. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Look at this. Same problem as Solomon, only worse. Why did he not learn? Listen, brethren. I'm glad. Is, how many times is that? Is that five times I said that today? Listen. Oh, I've been working on it. <laughs> All right. Well, we, uh, Bambi said I can't go, what, what was it? Um, she said I can't do that. She said she likes listening better. But listen. <laughs> Verse number 28, he says, Whereupon king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods. You know what you'll start doing when you reject the word of God? You just make up a God that fits you. You invent one that's convenient for you. Do you know why there's a lot of people sitting in church that have a God that's just convenient for them? He's okay with me and my lewdness and my vileness and he don't care. I can do the, what I want to do and he just is a big kiss in the sky. He's okay with it. I can live contrary to his word and he's okay with it. That's not the God of the Bible. If you're not careful, you start rejecting God. You will begin to invent a God that exists outside the scriptures. Look what it says here. I'm going to show you his problem. Verse 29, they set up one in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before uh, the one, even unto Dan. You know what your sins will do when you reject? Some of you there, you're holding that newborn baby. Praise the Lord. We just had another one born last night, night before last. Praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. You can keep fighting against God. But let me tell you where your sins are going to wind up. Them children you got. That family members you got. That you want to be saved. Because you're not willing. To stand on God's side. And listen to what he says. Jeroboam's sins. Are no longer just affecting him. Now the whole kingdom is affected by his sins. Let me tell you something. A lot of people think, well, it's just a little sin. It's just a little thing. Nobody, it ain't hurting nobody but me. You are wrong. Your sins affect a lot of people. Look what it says here. Verse number 31. And he uh, made an house of the high places and made high priests of the priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi, contrary to the word of God. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the eighth month, again, wrong month, the fifteenth day of the month, and uh, like unto the feast of Judah. And he offered upon the altar, uh, so he did in Bethel, sacrificing unto calves that he made, and it, uh, he placed in Bethel, the priest of the high places which he had made. See that twice? So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the month, even in the uh, month. Look at this. Here's the problem. Which he had 
devised of his own heart. You know what a lot of people think? I can just worship God any way I want to worship him, and he has to accept it. You're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. God does not have to accept your worship. He told you in his word how he wanted to be worshipped. He does not have to accept your worship. You say, I don't know about that. Okay, how about Elijah and those, what was it, 400 prophets? Those 400 prophets on that altar, jumping on that altar, calling for fire to come down. Did the God of heaven give them anything? No. Nothing. Listen, God doesn't have to accept your worship. You've got to hearken unto him first. And so many people want to do it their way, and they got a God that they devised of their own heart. You need, to, you need to stop your way and yield your heart to the Lord. His way is always best, y'all. It's always best. We, we, we want to, we all do it. We all do it. We want, to, we want to make up a God and say he has to accept it, and he don't. Let's look at this. Go to chapter 14. Let's see how all this ends. And this is, you say, what are you doing? I'm trying to give you a fair warning. This does not end well for Jeroboam. It doesn't. Jeroboam and his wife have a child. Remember I told you about your sins, how they affect your children, how they affect people around you? Jeroboam had a child. And I really believe you can see God trying to get his attention once again. But instead of being honest with the man of God, he sent his wife in disguise trying to trick him. And here this man of God is now blind. The same man of God he went to, Ahijah. He's blind now. He can't even see. But the Lord says, hey, Jeroboam's wife's coming to see you. I just want you to know what she, she's asking of you, and I'm going to tell you what to say. As soon as she shows up at the door, you know what the preacher says? Come in. He's blind. Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. God's got your number. You may think he don't have it, but he's got your number. Listen, y'all. Let's read verse 17. Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tizra. And when she had come to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him. And all Israel mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of the servant Ahijah, the prophet, and the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned. Behold, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings? Oh, yeah, they are. They are. Listen, y'all. I said it again. But it's because I want you to listen. There's a payday. You can ignore God all you want. And let me tell you something about our amazing God. He will put up with you and put up with you and put up with you put up with you and we could just go on and on but one day one day he's very patient very long suffering very merciful but there is coming a day when he's going to draw the line and say that's it I tried I'm done with Go to 2 Chronicles 13. Let me show you this, and we'll finish. We'll finish right here in 2 Chronicles. Another uh, account, if you take Kings and Chronicles together, you can, you can get more pieces of information because they kind of are similar accounts that overlap each other in certain parts. Um, let's look, go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 13. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. You say, how was his end? Let's look at his end. First Kings doesn't give you the details. Second Chronicles will. And in the eighth year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to 
reign over Judah. And he reigned three years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Melchiah, the daughter of Uriel, Gibeah. And there was war between Ahijah and Jeroboam. And Ahijah uh, set the battle in array with the army of valiant men of war, even 4,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men, being mighty men of valor. And Abijah stood on, up upon the mountain Zerim, which is the Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all of Israel. So this king of Judah sends a message, says, I want you to listen. I want you to listen why we're going to win this battle, and we're going to defeat you, Jeroboam, and this is going to be your last day on the earth. Watch this announcement. Ought not ye to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over to Israel, to David forever, even to him and his sons by a covenant of salt. Yet Jeroboam, son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, son of David, is risen up and hath rebelled against his Lord. And uh, there gathered unto him vain men. Do you see that? Do you know where your problems usually start? It's your friends. Jeroboam, according to what this king is saying, started out by gathering vain men to him. The people who were, what's vain mean? Worthless, no value, not doing anything. They don't care about anything right. They're vain. It's empty. How's your fellowship? What kind of people do you fellowship with? See, that's where it starts. Oh, you're going to church, Sheldon? Really? You're going to be one of them holy rollers? Man, don't you want to join us for a beer? Well, um, you know, really? You got to go to church? You can't go with us? It's vain men. You need to surround yourself with people who love you and encourage you to do what's right. Look at this. Verse 7, and there gathered unto him vain men, children of Belial, that have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And when Rehoboam was young and tenderhearted and could not withstand them, he says, Now, and now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, and be a, a great multitude, and you be a great multitude. And there are with you golden calves, which Je uh, Jeroboam made uh, you for gods. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and have made priests after the manner of the nation, uh, nations of the other lands, so that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, uh, the same may, uh, may be the priest of them that are no gods." But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. The priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait upon his business. You know what this uh, king said? You might have forsaken the Lord, but we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. You know what? He identifies Jeroboam's problem. What is his end? Verse 17. And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter. So there fell down slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. Wow. Think about that. Without muskets, without cannons, 500,000 chosen men. Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took uh, cities from him, Bethel, the towns thereof, and uh, Jeshana, and the towns thereof, and Ephraim, and the towns thereof. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. 
My question to you. Jeroboam's story, can you not see it could have been so different? Wouldn't it have been a blessing to read that Jeroboam finished right and did that which was right in the sight of God? Do you know he could have? God offered that to him in the beginning. Let me say something to you. Let's make it personal. God is offering for your end to be good and to be right. In fact, he's offering you everlasting life. He's offering you, some of you who are saved, if you would just yield to him, he'll bring peace to your life. Some of you have not had peace in your life in a long time. And you know why? Because like Jeroboam, you're still fighting every step of the way. Why don't you just quit? It doesn't matter what anybody else has done. Don't follow the bad example. You get it right. You go forward. Do something for God. Because I want to tell you, some of you, if you continue on the path you're on, when the payday does finally come, you're going to be very sad. And I'm trying my best to prevent that. I am trying my best to plead with some of you. You need to stop while you've got a chance. And you need to just go on and do it God's way. His way is the best. Learn, learn. We can learn from Jeroboam. It, it does seem like somewhat of a negative message, but... The, the positive that we can learn is you're at a crossroads and you can do right if you will. And I'm asking you, think about it this week. Will you think about it? Amen. Everybody okay? All hearts and minds clear? All right. Well, let's stand for prayer. If you need to do some business with God, I'm, I'm asking you to find somewhere.